what inspired you to present the cloud in, in a kind of methodological way? Well, I was inspired to present the cloud in such a logical way by the needs of certain people who came to the retreat house uh -huh. and who knew nothing about contemplative prayer, and that was the secular priests who came on retreat. Right. And I realized that like myself as a secular priest, I had never heard the word in eight years in the seminary. Uh, and I also understood when I read the cloud and also when I uh, took instructions in uh, transcendental meditation that wordless meditation could actually be taught. I, I'm, I don't think that transcendental meditation is exactly the same as contemplative prayer, but, and I, I think at the moment the comparison is odious, but the point is there are many, many approaches to meditation uh, and that are wordless, imageless, uh, and that's the foundation of contemplation. So when I read The Cloud of Unknowing, I recognized in it my own experience in wordless prayer, and I also recognized that this was an experience that priests who came to the monastery for retreat never had. And you had started me on giving them retreats. Yes. Uh, shortly after I made simple profession. That would have been in 1965. And uh, every other week I gave uh, retreats to uh, parish priests. And when I read The Cloud of Unknowing, which was purely accidental, I realized that it was actually a manual on how to do contemplative prayer. And um, I realized that it was, it was teachable. And so I started teaching it. That was in 1974, actually. And among those whom I was teaching it to, the, the, among the earlier ones was a group from New Jersey of very needy diocesan priests. Uh, and uh, one of them was Calarico. Another one was now Bishop Dominic Marconi. Uh, third was Eugene Romano. And the fourth was, what's his name? His first name was Martin. I forget his last name. Uh, um, Giordano. Martin Giordano, right. I taught the four of you at one, at one retreat, secular, uh, secular priests. I taught them centering prayer. Uh, priests kept asking me, if I would give them copies of my conferences. And it was at the end, at about around October of 74, I made the, my tapes, a set of two tapes on how to do contemplative prayer and uh, what the effects of contemplative prayer were. Uh, so they were made after I'd been teaching it for nine months. Uh, and that's when you gave a talk to the community on the need for sharing our contemplative dimension outside the monastery. Mm -hmm. And I remember distinctly, I, the very next day, I went to your office and I gave you a copy of those two tapes. So I had been doing it already for nine months. And I also remember distinctly you gave a copy of them to Basil, who told me he listened to them five times. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a matter of fact, um, uh, Basil used those tapes in all his conferences and in his first two books. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he almost quoted them word for word in his first book on Centering Prayer. Um, and then you started getting it, you started it because you were looking for an approach uh, that was not Eastern like transcendental meditation in order to teach mm -hmm. Christians, especially young people. Mm -hmm. 
contemplative prayer. That's as I remember it. I could be totally wrong. At this point, I'm not prepared to defend anything. <laughs> what is the to defend? Uh, the, I, I was not really much uh, a part of that uh, of the, the centering prayer uh, originally, as I remember it. I, I had too many other things to do to be able to give conference. It was only after we'd done it a year or two that we thought maybe we could train uh, some uh, other people in at the guest house so that they could teach it and, and uh, it could be uh, transmitted through them. Yes, and one of the first things you did was you invited uh, major superiors of religious orders. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember very d distinctly, then the three of us gave them talks on contemplative meditation. It was not called centering prayer mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, we only had room for 11 people. Yes. And I remember uh, there were a couple of abbesses oh, yes. of uh, contemplative orders. Uh -huh. I remember one abbess of a house of uh, 50 nuns, contemplative, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, she came in in tears at the end of the retreat and she said, Father, I've been doing this for 25 years, but I didn't know it was all right. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, well, sister, don't you have these books in your library? And I mentioned the cloud of unknowing. I mentioned Gustin Baker's wisdom. And she said, well, we put them all in the basement after Vatican II. <laughs> Why would she have done that, I wonder? But I don't know. I don't know. Also, interestingly enough, another person uh, who was a member of that group was Amon Pru. Yes. At the time, he was the provincial of the, of the La Salette Fathers. Yes. And um, he's now a, a retired Methodist pastor. Oh, I no, think it's, it's United, United Church, Church of Christ, of Christ. Yeah. pastor. And he was here last week. Yes. And he's still teaching Centering Prayer. Oh, very vigorously. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he wants to do more of it now that he's retired. But he, he was the head of the religious life committee, I think, right. of and the major superiors. Right, and he had a lot superiors. to do with that uh, retreat. And, and he was actually the one uh, that was later a retreat, I think, outside the monastery for a, a larger number of people. And uh, that's when he suggested the term centering prayer. He's the one who did made that, that suggestion. He had who Basil read... Basil claims that he did it. Who? Basil. Uh, well, no, I don't think so. Uh, at least I don't remember it that way. As I remember it, uh, Basil had said uh, that uh, Armand Prue had suggested. At least oh, that's, that's the way he expressed it to me. I didn't know that. But uh, the, in, you know, in chapter 3 or chapter 2 of The Cloud where he gives the method, he does use the phrase, center all all your desire on God. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but but um, Basil claimed that he got it from Thomas Merton. Well, Thomas Merton has something similar about centering yeah. your life on, of course, St. John of the Cross himself says that uh, Christ is the center of the soul. Where, so it, it, was, uh, it seemed anyway, like a reasonable name. I never liked it. It always sounded gimmickly to me. Yes. And that's why I still refer to it as contemplative prayer according to the cloud of unknowing. Yes. But I also uh, don't especially agree with your approach yes. that uh, this prayer in the cloud is not centering prayer, but is proximate to centering prayer. Um, the, uh, you can argue over what is centering prayer, of course. Um, but my, um, I simply accept the definition of the cloud, which is that centering prayer is this uh, lifting the heart up to the Lord with a gentle stirring of love, desiring him for his own sake and not for his gifts. And then if you wish, you may choose a word, a simple word of one syllable 
to express that desire, a word such as love or God, and use this word to beat upon the cloud of unknowing. And, and, and as, you, as you do teach, whenever you have distractions or whenever you ask yourself, what am I doing or what does this mean? Answer, he says, with this one word alone. And the, and the word is the name of God. Hmm. So, uh, but the cloud calls that contemplative prayer. Now, Walter Hilton actually calls contemplative prayer discursive meditation as the first part of contemplative prayer. So it's totally arbitrary what uh, contemplative prayer is or isn't. But my preference is uh, not to confuse people by uh, making those distinctions. I, I think the cloud says the work of love is contemplative prayer. So I refer to contemplative meditation as I teach it as uh, contemplative prayer according to the cloud of unknowing. Now, the, anyone is totally in his rights to modify that, change it, disagree with it. Uh, none of it is written down in, in, uh, in concrete. Uh, and I, you, do, you do vary a little bit from the cloud, and it has taken me 30 years, and I have forgiven you from it. Uh, but you do have a perfect right to do so. <laughs> but you're not a purist. Well, I, I, I think that basically the centering prayer as we teach it follows the cloud. Basically. On almost every, on almost every point, a few points that uh, might have been introduce but they're uh, they don't differ from the cloud I, I i don't ever remember saying that the, the centering prayer is different from the cloud oh yeah one of our many arguments about it which arguments by the way i always win because i can shout louder or as i'm willing to shout louder than you are as uh, uh but i think when push comes to shove you could actually help to me uh, but uh, you admitted that you had varied from the cloud, uh, which is perfectly all right. Uh, but I'm a stickler for the cloud. I stick with it. Uh, for example, you say the prayer word is any word at all that can be used as expressing your consent to God's will. Now, that is not wrong. Uh, and you can find an expression of that in the cloud. Yeah, the cloud says you can use even but, sin as your word. Right. Yeah. But what, yeah, but by sin he means help. <laughs> he he's ex explicitly says you can use God or you can use help. But uh, he says that uh, you should express your love by this word. Now, it, when you express your love, you are expressing your consent to God's will. But it's a step removed, as I see it. Mm -hmm. Although it, it's not worth arguing about. Yes. Because uh, I, I actually agree with you on it. But people have made a great deal about that, I think. And, and uh, some people even want to start a new church. On what uh, subject uh, is this? Over whether you follow Father Thomas, or whether you follow William, or whether you follow the cloud, or whether you follow... Uh, Lawrence Freeman, Lawrence Freeman. Um, I, I think that has been carried to absolutely ridiculous lengths. Uh, uh, the point is that it is prayer, it is an open loving of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it should be taught in whatever way is helpful to people who receive it. Mm -hmm. There's no rigid, hard and fast rules. Even my way is not rigid, hard and fast. Yes, it's, it's meant to try to recover the contemplative experience for Christians and, uh, and to bring it up to date in some of its language. Right. That's about it. But the, the cloud really has every point in it. And it's, uh, it's just that we live now in a three or four centuries later, I guess. So. 
How many centuries later? How many? I don't know. 600. Is it six? 600 okay. years. But it's the most wonderful uh, resource, and it's basically the, the spirit and, and teaching of the cloud that we're based on. Now, one thing that, that caused us, uh, you sounded very broad-minded in how to apply this, so presumably you wouldn't mind using another word than the names of, of God. But we have people who don't uh, really, uh, you know, outside the normal realms of, of Catholic and even Christian, you know, persuasion. So I don't think the prayer should be held back from them or the practice. Because as, as we've seen in prison, some men came just for the silence. And, and, and that began to change their lives according to their testimony. So, uh, and, and also we offered, uh, we extended the opportunity to people who preferred to use their breath or people who might prefer uh, a sacred glance as St. John of the Cross seems to recommend in his. So, uh, but it's in the intention, it's the intention and the intention has important. to be to love God. Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, yes, I, I, uh, if people tell me they use their breathing, I, I simply give them my blessing yes. as long as their intention is to love God. It yes. doesn't matter what you use. Mm -hmm. You can use any sound, any word. You can use any object of the five senses as a, as a yes. matter of fact. But uh, the, the attraction of the cloud is he makes it easy by giving us a mm -hmm. prayer word, which is a name of God. Most people can relate to it. But he, mm -hmm. he actually uses love as one of his names of God. Oh, sure. He uses sin, or but he explains that by sin he means help. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can vary between help and God. I warn people, though, about using the, the sin idea because yes, not too, uh, people not who too have too. a low self-esteem and whatnot, this can be very misleading. Yes, It's okay as long as they understand it correctly. Well, you know, the two of you, uh, and then with Basil, have really created a revolution in prayer. Well, Thomas is the one who really did that. And, and uh, I think Basil had very little to do with it in terms of the structure and the theology and the practice. He was a great popularizer. That's right. And he spent his time traveling the world, and he did a great job popularizing it. But Thomas really did. It, it, it's Thomas's thing. And, and, and when Thomas came out to, to um, when you came out to Snowmass, following me, of course, to Snowmass, mm -hmm. um, he sent me there, and then he followed me um, after he retired. And then you started giving at Archbishop Stafford's request, he asked you to teach it around the whole archdiocese. And I remember you went around into different parishes. Uh, how many parishes? Do you have any idea that oh, you taught it to? Well, there were, I think there were basically fairly few because we, uh, we had a sort of center in one of the parishes. Uh, oh, Holy Sister Ghost. Sister Bernadette was. Where you know, Sister Bernadette part. was. Uh, you know, was managing the... Oh, uh, she picked things. that up, yeah. And, uh, but that's how you started contemplative outreach. Uh, contemplative outreach didn't exist in anybody's mind at that point. Right. Uh, that didn't uh, come about until I saw that it, it might be helpful to have some kind of support system. Well, it came about in 1984, but the seeds of it were 1983 with this, again, this first group of us that went up for his first 15-day intensive retreat where he wanted to see what would happen if we did three, four hours of centering prayer a day. Well, when did he get you as a, as a full-time? Uh, in 86. 86, okay. But then I was with But it. you had been doing it then for well, 12 since years. You. I mean, you were the one that taught it. You, I always thought it was 75. But in 74, if that was it, our Yezu Caritas fraternity, which included all those guys you mentioned, right. you know, met every month uh, to establish Yezu Caritas, which is a priest fraternity, for the purpose of keeping faithful to centering prayer. 
and that's still they're still meeting. Yeah, that's on a right. monthly basis. But when but I went I, to Lama in 1983. Bill Sheen was there, and David Fernet and so on was on that retreat. And out of that, not centering prayer per se, but the seeds were planted, so that the next year when the group went, which included um, Gus. Gus Reiniger, oh, yes. that, that in 84 the seeds were planted to start thinking, don't we need some sort of organization? And that's how Contemplative Outreach came about, and that name came from Ed Bettner. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yes, Ed Bettner had a project. He was teaching along with the he chaplain. Was he was trying to set up something for interspiritual dialogue. And, but he had different folks that met uh, in the church where Thomas Merton had had uh, attended, and and he had as his office Thomas Merton's uh, the basement old office at the basement of the rectory. So it was Ed Bednar who who wanted to use uh, the material that Centering Prayer had been developing, the way we teach it, and so on, and. Uh, he, and uh, he tried to get some money from a foundation so that they could pay his salary because he didn't have uh, the means of support. Yeah. So he then invited several people as an informal board. He was calling it contemplative outreach, mm -hmm. including Carl uh, Gail Fitzpatrick Hopler and uh, Mary Mrazowski. Mary Mrazowski, Gus. And Gus Reininger. Was Skinner, Tom Skinner with us then? No, he wasn't with okay. us yet. So they had, there was some controversy between Gus and Ed as to what the approach should be. <laughs> and, Peter and Paul. But and Gus had uh, actually uh, uh, dropped his work as a, as a movie producer and gave a full year of his life. Well, to pretty much, this. but yeah. he, I don't know what he was doing. He had an apartment on the west side, and his family were there. So, so I saw, you know, that neither of them could do this alone, and they needed each other. But uh, that they, they didn't have the same <laughs> approach. Uh, Gus wanted to, to have it rooted in the, in the diocese or in the uh, Catholic tradition, and Ed was thinking of having it in a more interspiritual form that would be suitable for Columbia University, where he was acting as a, as a kind of assistant to the chaplain. So he got the money. Uh, I, I gave a retreat uh, to people in New Jersey, and at the end, Ed had asked me if, if we would join him in this project, and, and, and I said, well, uh, I said to God, uh, well, if you really want this, then uh, could you uh, provide the money? So for me, that was a sign to provide enough money for uh, Ed to survive. I uh, r really didn't have any intention of teaching centering prayer. Uh, or, or I had no thought of contemplative outreach when I resigned from Spencer, because I figure uh, Basil has taken over the project now, and, and he'll, uh, he had already begun uh, circulating some monasteries as well as, the, as other retreats. And, uh, and of course, I, as abbot, I had given him permission to do this. Um, and, uh, and, and I wasn't sure what you wanted to do. I thought maybe since you had the, the tapes and so on, you, uh, you might be uh, a little uh, offended by Basil kind of moving in and taking over the process, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't something I I was actually able to do until a couple of years later, and we tried to teach others how to do it. But he was he was so enthusiastic and so full of energy, and so much in demand. I mean, from people like. Uh, Armand Pru and so on. But uh, at the crucial point of, of setting up uh, a, a, a center with Ed Bednar 
would raise the funds and charge. Now, Ed wanted to use my material, but he wasn't trained. And I was afraid of what he would do with my material. And he wanted to bring in speakers from other religions. So that's why there was this, this uh, difference of approach between Ed and, and, uh, and Gus. And uh, we even had an interview with Cardinal O'Connor, who was very sympathetic. But when Ed said that there is a the seminaries were in terrible shape and other imprudent things. Which was about the truest it thing he true. could have said. Uh, that uh, bothered uh, uh, or, or undercut, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. The cardinal couldn't handle that? The, I don't know the cardinal was very respectful. But he also had a problem with, uh, with Pax Christi who was, uh, who, and so did Peter Gray, so there were complications. But the interesting thing was that, that the people who had the funds had given them, of course, to the chaplain because he had a nonprofit organization and we didn't at that time. So, uh, he, uh, since they disagreed, Ed uh, wanted to go forward, and he, and he had a meeting. But I told Ed, if uh, I, can't, uh, I can't remain a part of this thing, and you can't use my material without my permission, so I'll just drop out and you take over, which was what I thought was the final solution. And then, so... Did you so, find a better word? So... Okay. Carl, Carl attended the meeting, and then during which the chaplain had changed his mind, and he saw that Ed couldn't really do this, and so it was about to completely uh, dissolve. It hadn't made much progress. You talking about the chaplain at Columbia? Yes. Who was he? Paul. Paul. Paul Dittner. Anyway, He's a very yeah. dynamic guy. Yeah. Yes, he was, uh, he was really very fine and yeah. very supportive of this yeah. general idea. And, and Ed, when he's, uh, so the chaplain said, well, if you can't use Thomas's material, then, uh, then I, can't, uh, I can't support you with these funds. So you, you called me and reported it, and I had completely given up on, I thought, let Ed do what he can mm -hmm. with it, as long as he doesn't use my material. Right. So you said, well, why, would you take over? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said, well, I don't want to, I have to think about this. I, I, mean, I don't want to leave the monastery. And I don't feel that's my vocation. So I have to think about this. So I prayed over it, and I said, well, perhaps we can give it a, give it a try. But then we got incorporated, I think. Well, it took in, a year in, yeah, and, in uh, and, and, 86. And uh, I can't remember uh, Gus's first name. Oh, there it is. It came up. I'm suffering a little dementia, you know. I That's can't remember never. things. Yeah, yeah. Tell me no if it gets too bad. Yes. But I just couldn't, can't remember names. Yeah. But anyway, Gus... Uh, approach was probably the right one for those circumstances, and we could have had a, a lot more support from the diocese. But Ed's was more far-reaching. It was more mm -hmm. insightful, and it's the one that eventually, over time, a long time, maybe 20 years, became in place. But I can remember sitting in restaurants near Columbia, and they would start fighting in words, shrieking and bawling each other out. It was, it was wild. Fascinating. I said, is this the way a contemplative life functions? But uh, they both were strong characters. Oh, yes. And Ed has since acknowledged that he was mistaken and that Gus was, uh, was, yeah. was probably right. And Gus has gone to his eternal reward. Yeah. Uh, Gus has died, you know. 
and and Ed, I think for a while worked with the Trinity Church in New York on their right. board. Oh, did he? And oh, their yeah. charity. A lot of good came out of it, you know. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that's a, yeah. And the many things that Ed Bettner would like to have done then, uh, we're beginning to do. Are ha happening. That's so interesting. He was too, he was yeah. too ahead of yeah. his time. Yeah. But it's nice that we still hold the name Contemplative Outreach. Sometimes they say that uh, that's the uh, proof that these things come from God because the devil is fighting them. And, and he can do things like that. But that was only the beginning of our problems. <laughs> I mean, we had all kinds of other ones. Uh, and you know, this honestly is why I have, you've been, he tried for years and years to get me to join contemplative outreach. Right. Be on the board, do this, be on the fact, and I've consistently refused and this was why. Uh, it was a lot more pleasant for me just to teach centering prayer and watch all this stuff yes, go I on think without you were being wise. involved. And I, <laughs> I, I wish I had done it too, except that I felt urged in some way that I got backed into it, in my opinion, and, and so nothing, nothing that, I, that is out there is, is my work. No, you did the right thing, and, and uh, you know that you did persevere in it, uh, and, and and as I said, that your glory. It's not contemplative outreach. It's it's the whole whole spirituality that uh, uh, you, yes, you teach could, through. We it. could survive at this point without contemplative outreach, but the structure. Is, is 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 very valuable in providing a, you know some kind of center for uh, you know handling it requests or or to organize some support for the groups we've made many mistakes but on the whole it's uh, we have several formulas that we would, it would be a great loss if we lose them. but uh, right now there's a leadership team with the uh, that they're, they're trying to help figure out how best to, to, uh, to make it represent the organization as a whole. But it, it's moving of itself. It's now be out of our control, really. It's, it, we can support a, a structure that gives the information and the teaching integrally up to a point. But we don't have a building, we don't have a place, we don't have a school as such. Nor do we want one. We're a peregrinating kind of group. And so it has to be fairly flexible. Well, you know, it's, we're going to celebrate our 30th anniversary next year. And I always say to people, it's a miracle of God's grace and the power of prayer that this organization or organism continues because of the vast amount of good that it it's a funnels out. It's a conduit to make sure that there is a follow-up to great talks that you might give, or Thomas might give, or I don't give. It's just so good that you can send people into a place where they can be supported, either by prayer groups or retreats and so on, throughout the world. You know, so with all, with all um, that's gone on, it's amazing that it continues, really, to this point. And Thomas's comment about bankruptcy, we've never been close to bankruptcy, but like any good not-for-profit, you have just enough to get you through the year to do what needs to be done. You know, so it's, it's been, a, and it's been his inspiration of being there, you know, part of the focal point, you know. And the whole idea of leadership now is to, no one's going to replace him, nobody wants to replace him, you can't do that. But as Jesus you know, had his 12 apostles and 72 disciples. That's what we have in contemplative outreach. There's enough people who know the teaching well enough to truly help people come to the next level of the journey. And that's all to Thomas's credit that he encouraged that throughout the years. Or else, he, even Basil, Basil used to always refer everyone to contemplative outreach for the follow-up. I think you do the same thing. Yourself. I do, yes. You so. So you, so Thomas, they've all sent the people to contemplative outreach oh, sure. no, because exactly. they knew that that structure was necessary. It's there, right? Yeah, yeah. and was yeah. the help because it's so fragile. When the person first gets the message, they can lose it very, very quickly. Beside the the, the structural formation of contemplative outreach, though, I'm not sure that will redound to your eternal glory. 
uh, but what will redound to your eternal glory is how you have developed the whole idea of centering prayer and contemplative meditation and expanded it into a way of life and a, and a, and a way of life that embraces uh, all of God's all of God's beloved people. Well, I, I hope so. Well, you've, that's to me is the great thing you've done, and you've done yeah, it I very agree, extensively. I agree to the you develop a conceptual background that has really helped the the prayer be extended into daily life and the activity of of daily life. You know? Well, my my idea originally was to try to contribute something to the renewal of the Christian right. contemplative path is I saw all these people going to the East because there wasn't anything being offered in, in the Western culture, including in monasteries. So that was my motive and I, and I saw how, how a method and, and, and it seemed to me, now I may be wrong in this, but it seemed to me that, that that monasteries had a, a, a wonderful structure that was reliable, but that unless there was some means of adapt that structure to the individual's personal relationship with God and to develop that, that the potentials for transformation were not being communicated. And, and uh, I know myself, I hadn't really given a program of contemplation to the novices or the people, so I, I felt that that uh, uh, I had failed in that degree, especially when I saw the enthusiasm and how, e and how greatly these young people had benefited, you know, from things like transcendental meditation, but also Zen and the other things, precisely by having a method of prayer every day that practically uh, had to integrate the structures and their meaning into your uh, your own uh, being, body, soul, and spirit. So that's what I was following. And then it, it expanded when we saw that Protestants were just as interested in Catholics. So it wasn't reserved to clergy or 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 consecrated people. And, and then it, it, keep, it kept evolving. I really didn't do anything to make it evolve. But I began meeting other spiritual teachers. And I could see in, in their commitment the, the kind of commitment that I felt was missing in the Christian scheme of things because there was no uh, serious... Uh, method or emphasis on the daily practice of, of in cultivating interior silence. So, so the cloud precisely does that for whoever this disciple was. And, and, and I, I thought it was really wonderful. And it, and, uh, it, it's, it sort of ha improves on the pseudo-Dionysius in that it's less intellectual, it's more... Prepared. Well, it very definitely does. And, and what the cloud has introduced is the notion of love, which is present in pseudo-Dionysius, but hardly to the extent that it's in the cloud. It just dominates the cloud. Yes. In fact, he calls the prayer the work of love. Yes, very that's, important. Uh, that's very definite. Now, Basil, in his set of guidelines, emphasizes moving to the interior in love. And he wondered why I didn't use his, uh, his formula. Well, I, I agree 100% with it. It's just that love has such a variety of meanings in our culture that it's hard to distinguish it from erotic or, uh, or self-centered or, uh, or the filial piety or the bridal mysticism. And so I thought a word that would mean love, and I, I, I thought consent and intention uh, would include that love. And, but Well, in a very mundane way, when they said, go to the center of your being, people were really trying, seriously, trying to figure out exactly where is the center of my being. They didn't take it in a uh, allegorical way. They were actually wondering, you know, where is it? Here, it's here, it's here. Mm -hmm. So it was just as well not to get into you know, map quest, you know, when you're entering into the prayer. But you established a contemplative outreach out of that 
experience in the apartment. You remember in New York City, I forget where, I think it was Gus's apartment. And contemplative outreach was a container that held your teaching and spread it with all the different presenters, over 800 presenters, you know, that went throughout their areas, you know, presenting the word. So it was the, the genius was not only this teaching, but also the structure that helped, uh, helped to be a conduit of that becoming what it is today. It extends beyond the limitations of doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, this is so very strong. Uh, for example, St. Bernard in his, uh, in his sermons on the Song of Songs um, it talks about devotion, zeal, and love. Uh, he says knowledge and doctrine is important uh, but it, it, it can't compare to the reality of love. Um, and and uh, this is what people are experiencing in different religions. And, and, and I've noticed it's also changed me in that regard. I, we, as we develop our ideas of ecumenism, uh, Carl, you will, you will remember, because I'm, sure I'm sure you thought the same thing I did. When we first started this idea that we have to be ecumenical and we admitted it after Vatican II, we said, that's fine, sure, as long as they come over to our side, we can be very ecumenical. That was the first stupid approach well, that, it had, that we it had. had that aspect. Yeah, too, it had once that. we started meeting together, like in living room dialogue, yeah, we realized. The second step came, yeah. yes. And that is we realized that we had truths that we could share with each other right. that were very, very real. Right. Uh, and, and, and so we went beyond the idea of toleration, mm -hmm. which was the first step, into appreciation. Mm -hmm. and, and now I yeah. think we're going and have to go beyond appreciation into love. We actually have to love these other traditions. We don't desire to convert them or to have them become like us. Yes. And, and we have an understanding of, I, I, had, I had an experience, a, a traumatic experience, just three months ago. Um, I was invited to give four days uh, lectures on Christian meditation to the Sivananda Ashram in the Bahamas. Uh, and, and I went there and uh, uh, every morning we had a half hour of chanting, which chants, by the way, were really just what we would call the litany of the saints. Uh, <laughs> and um, then there was a, a, a half hour meditation and then an hour teaching. Um, I gave as part of my hour teaching the cloud of unknowing, but I was really dismayed to find out that before my teaching, we sat there for a half hour of meditation and the leader, uh, this, this Swami from India, a uh, matter of fact, uh, said to the people something like this. Now sit very quietly, close your eyes, take three deep breaths, enter deeply within yourself and be open to the presence of God and rest in that presence. <laughs> and then he just said, now be quiet for half an hour. And then I had to go and tell them this new innovative meditation <laughs> called Centering Prayer from the Cloud of Unknowing to these people who had been practicing it for probably 4,000 years. <laughs> you know, you were talking about conversion before and then appreciation. Uh, the word I was thinking where we're at now is communion. Which is love. I use the word love. That's right. We've got to love with each, right. love the other traditions That's even. Right. So there's yeah. a wonderful communion. Right. Station. Exactly. It's just very powerful. That's what ecumenism has, is coming to yeah. and what it should be. It's true. Well, I'm interested that you exhort people to love other religions because that's what I teach now that you, we're not really fulfilling our own religion unless we love the others, that is, respect them. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, so it's communion, not conversion, that is, right. that the ch churches have to practice.
practice. All religion have to practice now. And uh, plus a, uh, an openness to the re revelations of science, which these people, without knowing it, are, are in a sense the real apostles and prophets of our time because they're telling us things about God that we never imagined. Yes, the physicists are becoming theologians. Yeah, looks it's that true. Way. Yes. Mm. William, would you like to say a, a word of encouragement to contemplative outreach? You know, as we're celebrating, getting ready to celebrate our 30th anniversary. Well, I think that contemplative outreach. To a certain extent, is and can be, of course, the the expression of this love that we're talking about, um, that what ecumenism is really supposed to be, um, and uh, that um, it's not so much a defense of self or of anything uh, as it is an acknowledgement of a love which exists and should exist. And I think contemplative outreach is a you know very meaningful. Uh, way of communicating that love, of sharing it, um, of living it. Um, I'm in admiration of the people in contemplative outreach, certainly. Um, but I, I would, the only thing I would caution I would have is not to be narrow minded. Uh, not, there's one way or the highway. I, 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 uh, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'd, I, m I make a confession and do not deny when I teach centering prayer, I teach your word prayer method as well as the clouds word prayer method. Uh, and I also teach uh, Lawrence Freeman's and I leave it up to people to choose whichever suits them the most. Nobody can say what it should be or shouldn't be, but we can offer uh, the potentialities and the possibilities. And, and this is the direction I'll see contemplative outreach in going and I would encourage them to go in this direction. That they're not other than centering prayer. In reality, they are all forms of loving God. That's the important thing. But I think you, you should teach one method um, as a preferred method. I, I think that's perfectly legitimate. Right. Uh, because otherwise, for beginners, you can be confusing. Right. But at the same time, you, th there has to be an expression of openness. You Solidarity know? with the that, That's just the old, I'm the one true church again, yeah. you know, which, which really has to be avoided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you. Thank you for your words. Okay, is that sufficient for you? Yeah. Well, I think I'll take a little rest. You deserve the it. Usual. After 90 years, you deserve it. <laughs> well, I guess I have to do it. It's a question of merit. <laughs>